Welcome, welcome everyone. <laughs> yeah, welcome everyone. So my name is Gene Moreno. I'm the director of the Knight Foundation Art and Center. And it's our second public lecture for our fall 2020 seminar, which we're calling Recodings and Renewals. And I think the name to do with that our amazing new world of screen architectures and massive infrastructures and digital lives um, continues to drag things that come from another world, right? From a previous world from other historical moments, in particular, you know, certain regimes of accumulation that rely on dispossession and social hierarchies often structured, you know, along racial lines. So that's just to give you a, a mouthful of what the context of all this is. And it is my pleasure tonight to welcome Alec Galloway, who's a writer in computer programming, working on issues of philosophy, technology, and theories of mediation. Professor of Media, Culture, MU, the author of several books, Digital Media and Critical Theory, including uh, Protocol Control is Exercise After Decentralization, which MIT out in 2004, um, Gaming Essays on Honor, which in 2006, the, inter the Interface Effect with Polity put out in 2012, and recently a monograph on the French philosopher Francois L'Oreal. Uh, which is titled Real Against the Digital. Um, Alex also collab has collaborated with Eugene Thacker and Mackenzie Work on a book entitled Excommunications, Three Inquiries in Media and Mediation, which was published by the University of Chicago Press. And with Jason E. Smith, he co-translated the book uh, Introduction to Civil War uh, by the Tikkun Collective. Uh, for 10 years, he worked with a radical software group on projects like Carnivore, which is a software um, that can listen in on the internet. It can perform a kind of surveillance on the data, data networks, which of course are constantly surveilling us. So without further ado, Alex Galloway. Hello everyone, wherever you may be. Um, thanks, Gene. Um, and thanks to the ICA Miami for hosting uh, this event. I was really delighted when Gene um, sent out the invitation and I've been leading a three day seminar this week, Monday through Thursday, um, ending today with this talk. Um, so it's been a really <clears throat> exciting week. Um, and I am going to start this. Um, okay, so um, as a theme, I, uh, I uh, propose the somewhat ambitious, if not also ridiculous title of heretical computing um, as a way to think through the question of digital machines. Um, and let me just confirm, so the, the slides are visible, correct? Yeah? Visible okay, to great. Me. great. Um, so I'm thinking of heresy in both the active and passive senses. All those persons deemed heretical who are excommunicated from digitality, but also in a more active sense of trying to identify what is beyond, alongside, or without digitality. And the seminar on heretical computing was an attempt to explore the outer limits of technics through forms of hypertrophic digitality and exotic analogicity. Can we degrow the digital into something else entirely? Now, techniques of encryption, compression, entropy, indeterminacy, and opacity were thus a main part of the conversation, sort of one of the, the first kind of group we, of concepts we thought about. Seen here in the work of artist um, Hito Steirl, um, Stephanie Sihuko, and also in the work of Arya Dean, um, and I'm particularly drawn to Arya Dean's theoretical writings, for example, her thoughts on the notion of a black generic. We also in this seminar looked at uh, tissues, webs, and fabrics, textiles, of course, being one of the oldest and most enduring digital technologies. Here in the virtuosic loom work of Annie Albers, 
Um, or in a different way, uh, this piece by Nina Kachadurian, where she would repair damaged spider webs by hand using red embroidery thread. Or uh, Zoe Saldana, this work, um, who meticulously recreates perfect duplicates of everyday objects. In this case, a woven cotton fabric generating a simulacrum of an object, the drop cloth that itself would typically be removed from the exhibition space. So a kind of simulacrum of an absence. Or here, the question of digital memory through the work of Esther Parada, an early adopter of digital photography. And there's three images here following a kind of grid structure. They progress in series um, from one to two to three, starting with a montage of traditional photographic negatives um, and ending with a uh, strictly notational and symbol-based rendering here in the final image. And then the four, fourth kind of main theme we considered was that of cells, pixels, particles, atoms, and monads, all the kind of proper units of digital tech. So this Sonia Rappaport's classificatory clusters of marks and grids, or even perhaps Agnes Dennis's uh, stunning renderings of symbolic systems. Or here, something I've worked a lot on, um, the, usual, the unusual cellular systems by Niels Baricelli from the 1950s, where he claimed he had created an ecological landscape of synthetic life forms, all within the memory registers of one of the first digital computers in Princeton, New Jersey. So again, I'm thinking of heresy in both the active and passive senses, trying to expand the notion of the digital. So it might include certain kinds of work and certain kinds of subjects that don't fit the typical Silicon Valley tech bro, but also in a more direct interventionist sense of trying to identify what is beyond, alongside, or without, digitality. So there's kind of a sociopolitical story about edges and margins and, and glitches, who gets marked as the glitch. Um, but there's also a more, if you will, kind of machinic part of the story. What are the affordances of machines? And how can those affordances be exploited, hacked, inverted? And, and these are both part, I think, of, of what this weird notion might mean, heretical computing. So what would it mean to suspend the computer or to oppose it? What are all the things that the computer can't do? If computers have been designed and optimized in certain ways, then would the inversion of such optimizations constitute something like an anti-computer or a non-computer. For every positive afford affordance of the computer, one might assert an equally positive counter affordance. For every capacity, an equally potent counter capacity. Thus, given say an image compression format like JPEG or MPEG, it becomes relatively easy to posit the, if you will, the ideal image for such a system. What would the ideal image be? Well, from one perspective, the ideal image would be monochromatic and motionless. The apex of digital imaging therefore might be found in a motionless, field of color. It might be found in slow cinema. After all, androids don't dream of electric sheep. They dream of efficient algorithms. And algorithms love simple data sets. 
So ironically, the digital video encoder has never been happier than when given the job of encoding films by Chantal Ackerman or James Benning. These are computer-friendly substrates. And sure, these films convey analog themes and anti-computational aesthetics, but then again, aesthetics are always anti-computational. As a contrast, it would also be easy to generate an image at the antipode of computational form. And for maximum perversity, it ought to be generated by a computer, as this video was. Such a proposed anti-image would have maximum textural complexity and maximum kinetic complexity. It would be the pictorial form of pure entropy, a wide channel with continuous chaos. It would be white noise. And thinking in this way, I think, provides a kind of primitive mechanism for assessing aesthetic complexity in digital images or digital films. And likewise, to show how certain images are less compatible or more compatible with the compression codec. And uh, you know, for to kind of maximize this perverse entertainment, we could uh, you know play some games. We could subject certain films to restrictive uh, bit rate encoding, like for example, encoding Michael Bay's *Revenge of the Fallen* at the bit rate uh, more appropriate for Tarkovsky's *The Sacrifice*, just to underscore how debilitating it would be for Michael Bay to kind of be forced to degrow into Tarkovsky. And you might recall this, uh, Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice is explicitly a film about speech and speechlessness, um, which is another way to think about the digital analog distinction. The ideal image of computation thus begins to reveal itself. The ideal computer image is not just a slow image, but an empty one as well. Ideal computation is emptiness. Contrast this with other episodes in art history where empty frames are in fact quite difficult to achieve and are often only the consequence of tedious illusionistic techniques. Try taking an empty photograph, for instance. It's practically impossible. As artists like Liz Deschen have shown, the more you try to empty the photographic image, removing the camera, removing the object, the more lush and vivid it becomes. There's always some dust or something that makes the substrate even more luminous. And the same is true for audio recording. Try recording silence. Silence is a concept, it's not a reality, at least not in analog representation. In other words, analog representation has a very hard time being empty because it's already predefined as the thing that isn't empty. Whereas digital representation aspires toward an empty frame because the digital means framing and little else. Now, uh, Shane Denson's recent book called Discorrelated Images captured my attention in recent days. And it's a fascinating investigation into the contemporary image with an emphasis on cinema, but spilling over into other forms of Im image making as well. The gist of Denson's argument in Discorrelated Images is that Images have changed significantly in recent years. So much so that the basic contract of visual representation, that images produce more or less coherent reproductions of what they represent, no longer applies. Now, while such a contract has been endlessly critiqued and corrupted over the last several decades within 
theories of visuality and representation. Denson's particular contribution has to do with the devolution of the di digital image down toward the level of affect, sensation, and somatic reflexes, particularly via an aesthetics of incoherence, entropy, and chaos. And again, to be clear, this idea of the kind of industrialization of affect, industrialization of the senses has a very long history described in detail by people like Bernard Stiegler, Siegfried Krakauer, and many others. For his part, Denson's particular iteration is characterized, I think, by a certain post-millennial tension. Continuing on from David Bordwell's intriguing notion of intensified continuity and what Matthias Stork called chaos cinema, Denson goes a step or two further showing that coherent diegetic spaces are no longer required in cinema. Indeed, that the very notion of diegesis has lost most of the significance it once had. So this idea of the discorrelated is particularly appealing to me, not least because it entails or perhaps indicts philosophical discussions around so-called correlationism as begun by Quentin Mayasu in his influential book, After Finitude, published first in French in 2006. Denson's book will, I predict, help migrate these discussions from philosophy directly into media theory, a discipline arguably better equipped to consider questions of representation, analogy, and reproduction. Denson already furnishes a dazzling menagerie of discorrelated images. Some of them are about sensory overload. Some are about the seamfulness of the image, its inability to hide the seams and gaps of its own construction. Some are about the lack of continuity in montage and the bodily disorientation that such discontinuity might trigger. Some are about the disconnect between the diegetic and the non-diegetic parts of the image. We have them then a sort of zoology of discorrelation, a rough arrangement of the kinds of wild creatures that populate the contemporary landscape of images. Why not min-max this logic? Why not push the variables to the limit? Filmmakers like Michael Bay or Neville Dean Taylor might luxuriate in dis disorientation, but Bay is child's play compared to the many possible varieties of discorrelated images. And so what follows in the, for the rest of the talk are just, uh, uh, you could call them kind of studies in superlative discorrelation that I put together for, for, our, for, our, uh, for us to, to look at tonight. And these studies are certainly not exhaustive. Um, and I, I think several of them certainly overlap with some of the works discussed by Denson in his book. So let's begin by considering the image strictly as digital information. Digital images consist of mathematical values located at specific addresses. For static images, grids typically provide the addresses. And for moving images, blocks of pixels are located within the frame and then relocated according to movement transformation data and subsequently refreshed once they get to off kilter. In either case though, the digital image consists in bits of code placed at specific locations. 
And the, the image I'm showing you now, a, a hex dump of a, of a data file, I, I sometimes I prefer these kind of non-pictorial images of alphanumeric text because I think they better express the essence of the digital image. No real picture, just numbers arranged in a rectangle. Streams of alphanumeric characters are already fairly alienating to most people, <laughs> um, but we can go much further. Beginning with digital information, it's possible to accentuate discorrelation by min-maxing various aspects of the image. So we know from Claude Shannon that the information in a signal is based on the amount of decision possible within the encoding scheme. So following this, a monochrome image has less information than a highly textured one, as I was hinting before. Um, and this is confirmed practically as well as experientially. A monochrome color field will compress to a much smaller file than a highly textured one. The monochrome will quite literally contain fewer bits. Monochromes are lower frequency, while texture is high frequency. And hence, monochromes are less discorrelated, while high texture images are more discorrelated at least from the perspective of, of information theory. Can I have some before you put them in? So with this in mind, let's construct an image from scratch. Let's construct a moving image where every pixel is moving maximally within a binary gamut. And so we can label this a maximally discorrelated image vis-a-vis -vis binary information. In After Finitude, Quentin Mayasu developed what he called the principle of unreason. Quote, everything could actually collapse, he proclaimed. There is no reason for anything to be or to remain the way it is. Everything must, without reason, be able not to be and or be able to be other than it is, end quote. So given his interest in this sort of creeping chaos or as he put it, hyper chaos, I think we can give the name Miyasu discorrelation to this video. This is a chaos image, an unreason image, an image of what it might be like to withdraw from correlation. Yet here we reach an immediate impasse. When watching a chaos image, the white noise quickly smooths and coheres into a kind of consistent gray fog. Perhaps even ghostly shapes start to form in the background before disappearing as quickly as they arrived. It seems that pure static is not that different from stasis. Remember that smooth was the label that Deleuze and Guattari gave to pure difference. They called it smooth. Alan Badiou was less charitable. He called it monotonous. Either way, I think the insight is profound that pure informatic difference, pure difference at the level of syntax will quickly and easily invert into its opposite. A smooth image of consistency, or maybe we have to say consistency in change. And here I think lies the irony of the chaos image. When chaos reigns, Consistency also reigns. The chaos image is discorrelated and maximally so if, if we follow the logic from a minute ago. It's, it's discorrelated at the level of information, which is to say at the level of formal syntax. 
So compare this to something else. So compare this to the op art tradition, to a Bridget Riley painting, for example, which I would argue is more discorrelated than simple white noise. The Riley painting Fall contains less information than white noise, but it works much more successfully on the human sensorium than noise, thereby generating more discorrelative tooth. White noise is ultimately less discorrelated because it abdicates the question of form precisely at the point of exploiting form to the fullest. In attending to the specificities of form rather than form's outer limits, Riley's optical paintings more successfully elicit the attention of the viewer. In other words, if Mayasu images are discorrelated, they seem to be lower on the discorrelation scale than one might expect. Hyperchaos might seem discorrelated, yet to continue with the withdrawal from correlation, we need to virtualize the image even more completely. Not only at the level of syntax, but also at the semantic level and perhaps even further, maybe even at the metaphysical level. A higher tier of discorrelation would in fact discorrelate both sense and nonsense, both semantics and syntax. So Mayasu images are smooth within the width and height of the frame. They're also smooth along the time axis. In order to discorrelate semantically, we would need to have semantically valid imagery, both within each frame and also along the time axis. So I'm calling the second type brackage discorrelation. And in doing that, I'm taking a cue from Gilles Deleuze, who wrote about filmmakers like Stan Brackage in his book, Cinema Two. Here, Mayasu's chaos problem, that hyper chaos is actually monotonous, is solved by way of re-injecting semantic content back into each photographic frame. And this has a secondary effect of resuscitating the value of montage as well, whether it be montage between successive frames or between successive shots. And if you remember from Cinema 2, uh, Deleuze described Brackage's montage technique as um, a, a form of irrational cut. Interestingly, Stan Brackage and Michael Bay are kissing cousins, discorrelationally speaking. They both aim to accentuate the semantic disconnect within and between images in order to work directly on the viewer's sensory apparatus. And Michael Bay is in a perverse sense, merely a lesser Stan Brackage. Or to put it another way, the sorts of discorrelations sought by Bay were already plumbed much more thoroughly a generation ago by Brackage. Um, and in a different way, perhaps by structural filmmakers like Tony Conrad. Now, I, I haven't done this yet. These are just kind of studies in superlative uh, discorrelation. I, I haven't done, I haven't followed every path, but I'm also thinking about so-called saliency algorithms, um, building image sequences that maximize saliency differentials in subsequent frames. Um, and you might've read about this because the, the, the kind of interestingness of images was in the public eye recently when Twitter faced criticism over their so-called saliency algorithm used to crop images. So Twitter's saliency, it turns out, was less than equitable um, as it routinely cropped out black people while retaining white people. With Mayasu discorrelation and Brackage discorrelation, we're already dealing with temporal and spatial dimensions. So why not maximize further the discorrelation of dimension. Why not make all dimensions volatile? Point of view, 
Frustum, color channel, pixel size, pixel address, convolution matrix, resolution, frame size, frame rate, 1D, 2D, 3D, diegetic, non-diegetic, N diegesis. All of these things are at play. And we could call this approach non-Euclidean discorrelation. So following the example of non-Euclidean geometry, this type of image making denies certain categorical, categorical axioms, such as the postulate that parallel lines will never converge. And I think a good example of non-Euclidean discorrelation can be seen in Jean-Luc Godard's 2014 film, Goodbye to Language. Shot in 3D using a homemade camera rig that you see here, Godard exploited the affordances of 3D and discovered a new kind of stereoscopic montage. His trick was simply to pivot one of the cameras, a bit like going cross-eyed, thereby deviating from normal conventions about proper binocular sight lines in 3D. And here is um, Nico Baumbach's description of the effect, and I'll just read a paragraph. Godard also uses 3D to invent an entirely new kind of shot. Uh, stereoscopy entails filming with two cameras side by side simultaneously, producing a doubling of the image with slight variation. Godard experiments with separating the two cameras. The two cameras, each the off screen space of the other, appear superimposed, unless we alternate closing one eye, then the other to watch each image separately. So the two images were essentially conflicting. This is Nico Baumbach still. It is simultaneously a new kind of sequence shot and a new kind of montage, a marriage of Bazin and Eisenstein. At a minimum, it reminds us how little we know about what 3D cinema can do and what it might make possible if treated playfully and experimentally. Now, I was lucky enough to catch Goodbye to Language projected in a 3D movie theater and remember being floored when Godard broke the stereoscopic fourth wall. Unfortunately, I can't display these kind of broken binocular shots since they're technically unshowable without 3D. And as far as I can tell, Godard simply excised these shots from the 2D version of the film that's floating around online. Is it better, I wonder, to eliminate the virtuosic trick than clumsily approximate a similar effect in Flatland? Nevertheless, in his detailed parsing of Goodbye to Language, David Bordwell includes an approximate rendering of Godard's binocular discorrelation. For those of you who are curious, you can look that up. Now, while he doesn't mention Godard, Denson, Shane Denson discusses this sort of non-Euclidean discorrelation in other ways particularly during an analysis of what he calls edge detection in films, but also in games as well. And you might know in image processing, um, edge detection is when you try to find the edges of shapes within an image by searching for pixel ranges that change value dramatically within a small area. And if you find dramatic changes, you've, you've found edges. Denson focuses on a scene in Blade Runner 2049 where two women are superimposed virtually in the same physical space. As their bodies move, they alternately coincide before losing synchronization. And Denson coins a wonderful word to describe this effect not a sense of seamlessness, but seamfulness, the flaunting of non-synchronization within media systems. 
Why mandate identity when difference is much more compelling? And I'm thinking also of, of experimental films like Michael Snow's Wavelength, which also incorporated uh, multiple dimensions via superimposition. Um, and I remember sitting through a screening of this film in college um, at 45 minutes long. It's a real endurance piece. Uh, but if you're pressed for time, you can take a look at the two and a half minute version instead that's on YouTube. Denson also talks about computer games um, and the use of what he calls screen tearing effects. And here I could only think of Jody, who have created some of the most discorrelated works in the history of computer art. One of several projects based on hacking or misplaying computer games, Jody's piece Max Payne sheets only, disrupts several components of the image at once. And computers make this possible since everything is a calculation based on variables. If point of view is just a variable, it can flip and reorient to jarring effect. If a character model is just a set of data points, it can be changed at will. If rendering is just a simulation of rendering, why not clip visual shapes in absurd fashion, pushing the camera's eye into improbable, if not impossible, viewpoints? Multiple dimensions go volatile all at the same time. Not simply photographic or cinematic discorrelation, the Jody piece shows discorrelation within 3D computer graphics. Now, for, the, for this presentation, I've, I've tried to use animated GIFs actually as much as possible in, in the presentation materials showing you these little uh, film loops um, in order to avoid some of the li limitations of video compression codecs. Um, and then this is all being funneled through through the compression codex that Zoom uses. Um, although, of course, GIFs have their own limitations, uh, particularly when it comes to color. They're one of the worst formats for that. Um, but this struck me when I was trying to display white noise uh, in an MPEG, which is extremely challenging because the video codec really just chokes when presented with this sort of maximally discorrelated input. And I find it interesting that uh, discorrelated images are often, if you will, tamed by the codec through various techniques of interpolation, approximation, clipping values, rounding values. And in a sense, the machine enforces a certain minimum coherence, a certain minimum correlation, a kind of machinic correlation. So given more time, we could consider video compression more directly. Compression provides much fodder for appealing types of glitches known as data moshing. But the technology behind compression also opens up the frequency domain as a kind of virtuality ripe for discorrelation. And data moshing is the immediate indicator, I think, of a wider spectrum of possibilities. Maybe we could call it Fourier discorrelation that suggests a more radical deviation from coherence than what is available in the original signal. Um, although here again, uh, like the saliency idea, I, I don't really have anything to show um, since I haven't developed anything yet in, in the frequency domain. I guess what I mean is that the deeper one goes into discorrelation, the more empty and unrecognizable the image becomes. Perhaps this is what Calvin Warren means by mathematical nihilism, which he characterizes as the destruction of quote, both matter and form. Finding his motivation in 
on the one hand, Alan Badiou, and the other, Catherine McKittrick, strange bedfellows indeed, Warren imagines a kind of anti-math characterized by, quote, bursts, uncertainty and indeterminacy, by the unknown, the unpredictable, and the indeterminate. By his own admission, Warren's aim is, quote, to uncover the unsaid within the number. A noble pursuit, to be sure, one with strong roots in the tradition of Romanticism. Of course, art making and even philosophy is filled with attempts to uncover the unsaid, to render the unrepresentable, to reveal the unknown, or just to roll back to a degree zero of representation. Black squares, white cubes, white squares, and black cubes. Empty canvases, erasable ink, works that destroy themselves, destroying something as the work. The absence of the avant-garde gesture as the apex of the avant-garde gesture. And so at this point, I think we reach the ends of what logic and digitality discrete arithmetic can offer. To undo correlation more fully, one would need to suspend a lot of things at the core of digitality. We would have to suspend the principle of non-contradiction and replace it with something else, perhaps something like dialectics, the reconciliation of contraries, or perhaps superposition, the sustaining of multiple states concurrently. But I can't show that. Neither dialectics nor superposition can be rendered in a pixel image without dramatic use of metaphor. And you might recall the famous line from H.P. Lovecraft's story, The Color Out of Space. The color was almost impossible to describe, wrote Lovecraft. And it was only by analogy that they called it a color at all. And so I think for the most superlatively discorrelated images, the same is probably, by, is probably true. It is only by analogy that we can call them images at all. Now, I mentioned dialectics just now as one type of superlative discorrelation, um, yet authors like Carla Lonzi and Denise Ferrer da Silva have pointed out the shortcomings of dialectical thinking for any kind of radical politics. Lonzi in her 1970 tract, Let's Spit on Hegel, and Ferreira da Silva more recently. Denise Ferreira da Silva has written on how the dialectic itself, primarily in Hegel, but Marx is not off the hook either, will never help to explain blackness. Concepts like negation, opposition, or contradiction, these don't work for her because they assume that, quote, the distinction is between opposed presentations of the same form. And for her, blackness is different. Quote, blackness fractures the glassy walls of universality. Now, the Hegelians are rightfully crestfallen here, since according to them, this is precisely how the dialectic works, through strong negation. Yet, I interpret Ferrer da Silva as making a distinction between the dialectical tradition and that of, say, structuralism. And I'm, I'm not saying she herself would avow that label, but uh, structuralism uh, the dialectical tradition and, and structuralism, um, dialectics with its ravenous appetite for ingesting all forms of alterity and incorporating them into the universal. And structuralism, 
staunchly maintaining a point of structural exclusion necessary for the maintenance of the entire edifice. In other words, if correlation is obviously and even tautologically anti-Black, at the same time, discorrelation is anti-Black as well. And thus, discorrelative strategies like dialectics might ultimately perpetuate anti-Blackness. Regardless, to get beyond dialectics, one need only look to Franz Fanon, Cedric Robinson, Hortense Spillers, Cydia Hartman, or Fred Moten, since all refuse dialectics, according to Ferrer de Silva. And I'll just read a paragraph here. Quote, though Franz Fanon's refusal of dialectics is the most celebrated, I find this refusal also in Cedric Robinson's tracing of the black radical tradition. In Hortense Spiller's figuring of the flesh as zero degree of signification. In Sadia Hartman's refusal to rehearse racial violence as the moment of black subjectification and in Fred Moten's descriptions of blackness in the scene of violence, which refuse a simple reconciliation with the categories and premises of modern thought, end quote. To be sure, the master or slave dialectic is often held up as a kind of ideal for, uh, rec for, for recognizing and overcoming difference. And the good faith Hegelian will say, even here, there is mutual recognition, whether master or slave, the one recognizes the other. They both are debilitated in their relation and they both will be resolved. Yet Carlo Lanzi was skeptical of the logic of recognition and identification. Quote, identification has a compulsive male quality, she asserted. It strips the bloom from existence and subjects it to the demands of a controlling rationality. And I think Ferrer de Silva would say something similar. Identification is the compulsive tick of whiteness. The Hegelian subject who recognizes is part of the logic of racialization. And so I wanted to kind of end in this way to point out some of the problems I think around correlation certainly, but also around um, any attempt to embrace discorrelation. So just, just to uh, finish, um, I've arranged uh, these various examples into a kind of uh, uh, system of discorrelation, circles of discorrelation. Um, and I won't read through everything here, but um, the first level, a kind of hyper saturation of sensation. Um, we looked at the, the kind of chaos level, the principle of unreason. I mentioned that, that the semantic uh, content of the image uh, could also be suspended, could also be discorrelated, but only if it was there to begin with. Uh, I showed a little bit about this idea of non-Euclidean discorrelation dealing with um, the disintegration of various uh, dimensions. Um, the idea of Fourier discorrelation, the most vivid example being uh, data moshing, but I think uh, there's a lot of other things that can be done in the frequency domain. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, this notion of this, the, the, the abstinence of, of, of representation, um, the withering of correlationism.